This is Dr. Chris from and Dr. Zahn. From Operation Arch, and we are here in Dr. Zahn's house answering questions about coronavirus. And That's the house, right. The house is a right old mess, so we're only going to show I you. I am this. not turning the camera around we're on my you this little private stuff. tiny bit of wall. Now, question number 842, Chris. Who's to blame? Because I think blame is very important. I remember when we were little, you always used to do annoying things. And I always tried to get everyone to understand that it was your fault. Well, that is true. And anyone in, uh, who's at school or with a family knows that blame can feel really important. But I you'll love also know to blame. But you'll Dr. also Chris. you'll also know that often when you try and sort out who started this, grown-ups are not very interested. It's true. And that's because Typically, no one really started it. There's a misunderstanding or an initial problem and no one is actually to blame. And that is the situation here. There is no one individual, no country and no culture that is specifically to blame. So this virus could have jumped anywhere in the world. It happened to jump at a food market in China. Jump out of animals. Jump out of animals, but it could have happened bad. anywhere. So the truth is no one is to blame. Blame is not going to be helpful here. And uh, the most important thing we can do is to realise that as a species... We are facing a big threat um, and we need to all pull together. And the biggest, most important thing is going to be to be kind to each other. So be nice to everybody. And don't worry don't about hug who them. started it. Yes, but no hugging. No hugging. A little elbow bump or a little foot tap. Bye! <laughs> uh, hi, Zand. Oh, hello, Chris. Sir, what have you been doing? Making toast and jam. Would you like some? Oh, I'd love some. I love toast and jam. Uh, actually, no, I, I hate toast and jam. Well, more for me. Oh, whoa, whoa, Zand, before you eat that, when was the last time you washed your hands? Looking at them, I'd say fairly recently. Well, I think it's time to wash them again. Never mind that, Chris. It's time for Investigation Ouch. Every single day, your hands come into contact with all sorts of things, picking up a lot of bacteria along the way. But just how often do we wash our hands? Well, I'm going to find out using a special scientific tool called asking people. When was the last time you washed your hands? Uh, just before I left the house, which was probably about 20 minutes ago, maybe. Oh, really? OK. A couple of hours ago? Yeah. yeah. At school. When was the last time your dad washed his hands, do you think? I think it was never. You think he's never washed them? Good uh, morning. Good morning. morning. Yeah. What time is it now? It's about... <laughs> it's late, late afternoon. So, maybe we don't wash our hands quite as often as we think we do. But why does it matter how clean our mitts are? Well, there are harmless bacteria on your hands, but your hands also play a crucial role in spreading illness. In fact, four out of every five illnesses are spread using your hands. Although you don't need to wash them all the time, washing your hands before you eat and after you go to the loo is very important, and I'm going to show you why. So, I'm gathering as many handprints as possible on a special jelly which will help to show what bacteria are on people's hands. That's well brilliant. Next, I want to take a second handprint after their hands have been washed in water to see if there's a change in the amount of bacteria. Finally, I want to see the difference soap makes. So I'm getting my volunteers to wash their hands with soap and water. OK, so you do the backs of your hands. Oh, you get your in between your fingers. This is an absolute masterclass in hand washing. What about a nice, clean high five? Now our samples head off to the lab, where they are put in an incubator set at exactly 37 degrees, which is the same temperature as your body. They will happily grow in this perfect bacteria breeding environment for 48 hours. Keeping an eye on our batch is virologist Rhiannon Lowe. So, Rhiannon, what have we got here? OK, these are the plates that haven't been washed. So we've got normal skin flora that we've been growing up. So we've got lots of Staphylococcus species. We've got Streptococcus species. And that's kind of exactly what you would expect this from is, a regular hand. This is regular. normal hand flora. You can see the four fingers and you can see the thumb. Check out these furry fellas. Like to smell. Ooh, yeah. that, is, Ooh. Uh, that is a strong smell. So these are bacteria that you might find on your hands after not washing your hands after going to the toilet. Okay. So there will be faecal bacteria. Yep, that means poo. And these bacteria can cause food poisoning. So can we have a look at the next lot then? Yeah. A lot of people don't wash their thumb very well at all. So your thumb tends to have a lot more bacteria on them. And what, people just stick their Yeah, just wash it like that. And attack, literally and their, their thumbs, thumbs are sticking are out like that. So there's still definite handprints here. It's clear that water alone doesn't do much. What about number three then? Number three, let's have a take a look. 
Squeaky clean. Well, almost. It's just a few sporadic colonies. It just goes to show that using soap when you wash your hands is so much better. There are bacteria on your skin that are actually doing you good. So there's no need to keep your hands squeaky clean all the time. But washing your hands with soap and water, especially before you eat, is a great way of protecting you from getting sick. And remember, when you wash your hands, do it thoroughly. A good 20 seconds of washing with soap and warm water will keep your mitts clean. And don't forget your thumbs. This is Dr. Chris. And Dr. Zand. We're doing coronavirus question time. And Chris, this is question number 8,765, part B, self-isolation. What is it? What do you think it is? Uh, I think it's probably when I get into some kind of bunker, maybe a secret base. No, you don't Maybe a, a monastery on the top of a hill in no. faraway Tibet. No, you don't need a monastery or a bunker or a secret base. You don't need to go to some far-flung corner of the earth. All you need to do is stay at home okay. for seven days. Now, when you're at home, there are some other things you need to do. So you need to stay two metres. That's about six feet. That's about the height of Zandarai. A couple of big steps. A couple of big steps away from everyone else, particularly older people. You should sleep on your own if you possibly can, and you should get other people to carefully give you, without touching you, your food and any medicines. You can That's keep right. yourself feeling good with simple medicines like paracetamol. Always read the pack first. Get a grown-up to help you with that. And what you mustn't do is leave the house. Most importantly, you have to keep washing your hands so that you're not leaving little bits of virus everywhere in case you are infected. Seven days not leaving the house could be pretty tough. We've got some other tips in other videos to help you through it. But good luck and look after yourself. Bye! I'm wearing a special suit, but can you guess what it's used for? Oh, I know. You're going into space. Uh, nope. Try again, Zand. OK, I've got it. You're about to drive a Formula One car. Uh, no, Zand, wrong again. How's he doing that with the music? Anyway, Zand is wrong. This is PPE, or personal protective equipment. It's used so that doctors and nurses can treat patients with serious infections without getting ill themselves. Um, I knew that, really. Now, you might have seen suits like this on the news because of the recent outbreak of a very serious virus called Ebola in West Africa. Now, these things make the news because they're rare, but they're also very serious. So, what can we do to stop them in their tracks? Well, it's something I'm closely involved in. So this is the lab that I work in when I'm not on Operation Out. Ooh, I've always wanted to see Chris's lab. This is my boss, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, Chris. Who's that? That is Operation Out. Hi, Operation Out. Oh, hi, Greg. Come on, Chris, you've got work to do. Now, I study a virus called HIV, but scientists like me study all viruses using really similar techniques to work out how to treat and prevent diseases. And I'm about to show you how we do it. An infectious disease like a virus is similar to a burglar who's found exactly the right spanner to break into your cell's security system and infect them. Scientists like me Oi. want to find out which part of the virus spanner unlocks the cell. Then we can stop the spanner working and create medicine to make people better. To show you how we do it, I've created my own infectious disease demonstration. I'm going to start with a real virus but there's something else. Now, to understand how viruses work, we need to make mutants. To make a mutant, I take my original virus and change one thing about it by changing the shape of the spanner. Today, I'm making two different mutants, mutant 1 and mutant 2. They're both the same as the original virus. Except I've made a different change in each one in their spanner to see if that change stops that spanner working. I then add each of these samples to healthy human cells to see which one is able to infect them. OK, so now the moment of truth. First, I'm going to show you what uninfected cells look like. So these are healthy cells with no virus on them. They're nice and stuck down to the plate, and there are lots and lots of them. 
now cells that have been infected with the original virus. And can you see, all the cells are clumped up and they're floating around, there are a few of them. Then I turn on a special light and the cells glow green, which tells me they've been infected by the virus. So we know this virus is working really well. It has exactly the right spanner to get inside these cells and infect them and make them sick. Time to see what's happened with Mutant 1. Can you see that? The cells are floating around and, just like the original virus, they're all green. So this mutant, the first mutant, still has a working spanner. It can get inside those cells and infect them and make them sick. Now let's check Mutant 2. They look really healthy and there are lots and lots of them. And when we put on the special light, none of these cells are green. So the spanner of Mutant number 2 virus is no longer working. It's not able to get inside the cells, infect them, turn them green and make them go sick. So that's great. We've now discovered which bit of the spanner is the important bit for getting inside cells. Curing a disease doesn't just happen in a day. I've given you a demonstration of how we go about it. This is Dr Chris from... And Dr Zand. ...from Operation Ouch. And we're here with coronavirus question time, question 672. Chris, I heard this is created by the Chinese government. Is that true? No. Was it created by the American government? No. What about the British government? No, it definitely wasn't. I also heard it was created by a mad scientist, a virologist who... Wait a minute. Chris is looking nervous. You're a virologist. Did you create the coronavirus, Chris? No, Sam. I am a virologist and I work in a virus lab, but I did not create this virus. And in fact, no scientist created this virus. We know that this virus was transmitted to human beings from bats. Bats. Now, we don't know which bat exactly... We're still trying to match up the genetic code of the virus that's in humans and the virus that's in bats, but we're pretty sure it came from bats and it may have gone through another animal first. How did it get into people from the bats? Well, that's one of the things we're not entirely sure about, but we, th we know it came from a food market in China. And one of the problems with the way that we eat animals all over the world, whether they're wild animals or whether we're farming them, and it's important to understand this could have happened anywhere, is that when we crowd animals together in, in cruel farms, or when we eat wild animals and we destroy ecosystems, that gives viruses like this a chance That's to jump right. from animals to people. So as a species, we all have a responsibility about this. And, and this virus is another sign that we should be looking after our planet because this has happened before, it's happening at the moment, and it could happen again with other viruses. Well, that is a lovely answer, Chris, and I am glad that my brother is not a mad scientist. Good. So if there's one thing we can learn, is that we should be looking after the planet. Bye!